So this version is going to replace the prior one that was put up at 6 o'clock between me and the screen. Uh, this time I'm doing it in front of a live class that's heard two-thirds of what I'm about to say, and one-third of it is going to be new for them as well. In a nutshell, what this paper said was that uh, the idea is to explain cognition, and Turing's own contribution to this was that, was that the way to explain cognition is to explain what you can do with your cognitive capacity. If you've explained what you can do with your cognitive capacity, then you've explained everything that there is to explain. And the punchline of this paper will be, it's true that you will, be, you will have explained everything that there is to explain, but you will not have explained everything. Okay. Uh, the conventional way to talk about this is that uh, Turing's method solves the so-called easy problem of explaining our know-how, but it doesn't solve the hard problem of explaining why it feels something it feels like something to be a system that has that know-how. Um, Turing was born in 1912, which means that we're going to celebrate his centenary next year. Get set for it. And consider this to be the first parting volley for uh, Turing Centennial. He's done huge contributions all over the map, mathematics. He saved us during the Second World War uh, with his uh, work on the Enigma machine. And uh, even in computation and, and, uh, and uh, logic, he's made multiple co contributions. One of them was the so-called Turing machine. The Turing machine was a, a, a model for what computation was. But his main contribution to cognitive science was to ask what cognition itself is and how to explain it. And what he basically said was that cognition is as cognition does. And the question of cognitive science, he didn't talk about cognition because there was, they weren't talking about cognition in those days. He talked about intelligence. And there was no cognitive science. But what we want to do is how and why, answer the question of how and why we can do everything we can do. The emphasis is on doing. Uh, he invented the Turing machine, which is simply a formalization of the intuitive idea that mathematicians had about calculating, computing, effective procedures. What does it mean to be able to do something that, result, that gives you a result that you can count on? They all had intuitions about what it was, and several people independently tried to formalize it and, and specify what it was. By the way, this is not Turing, the, uh, the, the notion that a Turing machine captures computation is not a theorem. The theorem is telling you what the powers of a Turing machine are, but there's no theorem that can prove that what mathematicians mean intuitively by computation is this. However, it's constant, that intuition is constantly being um, um, confirmed and repeated by the fact that every instance of what mathematicians and others have considered computation have, has always been an instance, a special case of a Turing machine. And others, like Church and um, Gödel, came up with independent formalizations of what computation was, and they turned out to be equivalent to a Turing machine. So any of these formalizations are, uh, is equivalent to any of the other ones. There, are, there aren't different, different ways uh, of um, formalizing computation. They're all the same. As I say, it's just a conjecture, so you can't say for sure that tomorrow mathematicians won't come up with something that they all agree is computation but can't be done by a Turing machine, but so far it hasn't happened, and it's not likely to. The natural extension of the idea of a, a Turing machine was, uh, was uh, based on the power of the Turing machine, which was the church Turing thesis that basically just about anything can be computed, not just every mathematical um, question that you might, you might want to ask, but also uh, physical processes can be approximated by computation. You can't, you, can't, uh, you can't compute a waterfall, but you can simulate a waterfall as closely as you like, capturing all of the properties. And by the way, what I said about uh, computation before, I'm not going to talk during this talk, and I'm not going to uh, put you through it again. But of course, you can't compute everything. There are a few things like Gödel's theorem that suggest that uh, there are things that are not computable, but that's not relevant. It turns out that computation is super powerful, and a natural um, lem uh, sort of corollary of the fact that computation is so powerful is to assume that, after all, cognition is a form of computation as well. So 
it might be the case that Turing was the first computationalist. I myself don't think that's true. I think um, Turing had something wider in mind for computation, for, for cognition, for what cognition was, than just computation. Uh, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, there, he proposed the Turing test which is ambiguous about this. He proposed that the way you find out whether you have managed to explain cognition is that you design a system that can do what, cogn what cognizers can do. And if it can do what cognizers can do and do it uh, in such a way that you can't even tell it apart from cognizers, then you've explained cognition. And he stressed that it has to be able to do everything cognizers can do, and it should be totally indistinguishable from a, from a cognizer, because it's easy to just do a little toy piece of what, of what uh, human brains can do. For example, we already have, that we didn't have in, in Turing's time, but we have chess um, playing programs, we have Jeopardy playing computer programs like, uh, like Watson now. Those are just doing little fragments of what people can do. In fact, what, what, what uh, Watson does, a lot of people can't do. I suppose these people on this program are superstars in Jeopardy. Not, we're not all superstars in Jeopardy. And, and uh, um, Turing, when he said it has to do everything people can do, he didn't mean that it has to be Einstein. What he meant was sort of the average person in the street, what they can do, what you would expect from them. That's what you would expect uh, the uh, system to have to be able to do. Anyway, the form in which he put it, the Turing test, which tests whether you can tell the candidate apart from a real person, a real cognizer, was the verbal or email version, the pen pal version, where you're sitting uh, communicating by what would now be um, by email with the candidate. What I want to stress is that the, um, the test is not meant to be a trick and, that, and it's supposed to last basically a lifetime because if it's really a scientific test of whether the system can do anything a person can do, you can't find that out in 10 minutes or in 15 minutes. Uh, you need to be able to put it through its paces, and moreover, if it's going to pass the even more demanding test of being indistinct, not just being able to do it, but being able to do it in a way that a person can't even tell apart from a real person, that takes, oh, that, that, should be, that power should be there for, for, a, for a lifetime. So you should think of the Turing test as something that takes place for a lifetime. T2, or the verbal version of the Turing test, um, would be email testing to see whether somebody's distinguishable that way. But um, T3 is the one that uh, requires robotic distinctiveness. And, and uh, if you think about it, I mean, there's a lot more we can do besides talk and listen and understand. We can interact with the world of objects that our talking is about. And it, uh, I'm, I'm not making any judgments about what it would take to pass T2, but um, surely, T2, passing T2, the, the uh, verbal version, would draw on the kinds of powers that you would need in order to pass three, T3, the robotic version. Now, there's some people who are not even satisfied with T3, and they remind you that, after all, um, Turing's argument that um, you can't ask for anything more is not quite correct if you stop at T3, because there's also the brain, right? We know that uh, there's, there's objective things. If we were talking about doing, well, it's not just the body that does, it's also the brain that does things that you can observe and, and you can record and you can um, st uh, measure. Why leave those out? So that's T4, the neural behavioral Turing test, if you like. Um, this particular uh, talk for the consciousness online is about consciousness, and so I don't really want to spend a lot of time on the virtues of T4 versus T3. I'll, I'll talk about them a, a little bit in passing, but pick your, take your pick, whichever T-test you, uh, uh, you uh, favor for what's going to follow. But leave one of them out. Leave out the one where it's T2 and where the way you, you pass T2 is by computation alone, because that one has already been refuted by Searle's thought experiment. If, if the Turing test is the email version of the Turing test, and if it's conducted in Chinese, it could be in any language, but it has to be in some language. It's conducted in Chinese, meaning the candidate is a pen pal for a Chinese speaker for a, a lifetime. Um, and if the way that the T2 is passed is by computation alone, which is to say just symbol manipulation, computation and, and what all of these different um, formalizations of computation had in common was that computation is symbol manipulation. You have little symbol tokens which have a certain shape, and that shape is arbitrary. 
you manipulate them according to rules. The algorithm tells you what, what you do with the squiggles and squaggles, as, as, as uh, Searle called them, in order to get some result that we're interested in, for example, passing the Turing test. And the whole, the symbols and, and, the, and the combinations of symbols are, have meaning, but you don't use the meaning of the symbols in manipulating the symbols. The computation doesn't draw on the meaning any more than in geometry. When you're doing a proof in geometry, you draw on what the figure looks like. The figure is sort of a, an aid to your intuitions, but you can't point to the figure and say, obviously those triangles are congruent. Look, they're congruent. It doesn't work that way. Same thing with, uh, with the symbol manipulation with, in, the, in the Turing test. It may be that in Chinese, the, um, the, the uh, pen pal is saying apples are red, but it's no use saying, well, look, he said the apples are red and apples are red, and therefore, what, what are you asking for? The fact is, all he, did, all he said was squiggle, squaggle. And the one that can tell, that can, that's there to testify that all he said was squiggle, uh, squaggle is Searle himself, because um, one of the other properties of computation, besides the fact that it's just based on the shape of the symbol and not their meaning, even though it's interpretable as meaning something, it's not the, the meaning is not part of the system, if you like. Um, the other property is that you can implement the same algorithm, the same computer program, in radically different ways as long as you implement the same rules and the same symbol manipulations. It's the same computation. Computation is implementation independent, implement, independent of the physical way in which it's realized. It doesn't mean that you don't have to realize it physically. It has to be physically realized some way or other. But the details of how it's realized are, are irrelevant. And so, in particular, when Searle is the one that implements the algorithm, he's the one that executes the computer program that passes the Chinese Turing test, he's in an implementation too. And whatever is true of him is, is true of the others, and whatever is false of him is false of all of the other implementations. And he tells you, uh, honestly and truthfully, that he doesn't understand Chinese. And therefore, T2, when passed by symbol manipulation alone, is not enough. But we could, all right, but, but we're not here to talk about Searle, that we knew it wasn't enough because we knew that by Turing's um, criteria alone, by his own, on his own ground rules, we're talking about everything a person can do, and people can do more than exchange email. I went on a little bit to try to explain what it is about, uh, about um, symbol, symbol manipulation alone that isn't enough. Searle has demonstrated that um, cognition can't be all computation. He hasn't demonstrated that it can't be computation at all. So what do we do with computation in order to make it able to pass the Turing test and not be, uh, it not be vulnerable to Searle's, uh, Searle's counter-argument? And that's the symbol grounding problem. And, and the suggestion is that uh, cognition is a lot like a, to a first approximation, it's a lot like looking up something in a Chinese Chinese dictionary. You look up a word and you get the definition. So everything that you need to know is there. It could also be an encyclopedia. So it could be more than a definition. It could be an explanation. But the definition, the explanation is also in Chinese. So if you don't know, you've got to look up those words. If you look those up, you find more words. And, you, and so on and so forth. So, so you're, you're lost in, a, in, a, in an endless regress without ever getting to meaning. It's all just symbols, squiggle, squiggle, squaggle, squaggle. How to get out of that? Well, T3 is the way to get out of that. T2, this kind of problem is a problem for T2 alone. T3 uh, uh, connects the symbols that are going on inside the system's head to the objects, events, and states of affairs in the world that the symbols are interpretable by somebody who, who does have a mind as being about. So, uh, as referring to, so, so uh, whereas in the, in the, in the, um, in T2, in the verbal version of the Turing test, it all depends on some external interpreter, for example, the pen pal, interpreting the symbols, and in their mind, the symbols somehow take up meaning. But since we're in cognitive science, and we're trying to explain how symbols take up meaning, you can't just keep, just like you can't, keep on regressing onto different words in the Chinese Chinese dictionary. You can't regress onto symbols going on in the heads of some other person. That's a little bit like, a little bit like the homuncular um, mistake with introspection, which is that um, you're, you're always deferring the problem of cashing in symbols for meaning by going from head to head to head. That doesn't work. The buck has to stop somewhere. That's the symbol grounding problem. And the way to do it is to pass T3 rather than T2. Um, but how do you pass T3? It's a case of 
let's let's agree that uh, cognitive cognitive science is not a basic science like physics and chemistry. Not even perhaps not even like uh, biology is sort of borderline. I think biology might also be reverse engineering because after all, biological systems only occur on our planet. They don't occur occur all over the universe the way matter does. So when you're studying matter and the general properties of matter and the origins of the universe, you're doing basic science. When you're doing biology or cognitive science, you're doing reverse engineering. You're looking at stuff that's already there. And the reason it's reverse engineering is because you haven't built it. You're actually trying to, it was built by the blind watchmaker evolution, if you like. Uh, and you're trying to figure out how it works. So you're reverse engineering. You're trying to figure out the principles. In forward engineering, you know them already because you built the, the device. Um, and, and in particular, what you're trying to do is find a causal explanation for the capacities, the powers, the functions of the device. Like a, a clock has, you know, a, a clock can do certain things. Remember, we're talking about doing. A clock can do certain things, and, and its inner workings are the and, the, and the, and the explanation of its inner workings are the explanation of its um, causal powers. Combustion engines in the middle are the same sort of thing. And if you want, the brain is the same sort of thing. The brain can do, with the help of the body, everything that we can do. And to reverse engineer, reverse, engineer, reverse engineer the brain is to figure out how it does it. And once you, figured, if, once you think you figured out how it does it, you've got to build something that does it to see whether the, 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 the causal explanation you give really works. Otherwise, you're just um, describing, but you're not explaining. And I, I want to remind you that this would have been just as true if all devices grew on trees instead of being built by us, if toasters and planes and, and uh, rockets and, and robots and, and uh, computers had come naturally off of trees, then we'd have had to reverse engineer them as well. Okay. Now, you'll be relieved to know that we're not far from the end of this talk, and we're now at the end of the two-thirds that you're already familiar with. Okay. We've got tons of euphemisms for, uh, for uh, consciousness, and they don't get us anywhere. You know, consciousness, awareness, qualia is a fancy one, subjective states, <coughs> conscious states, mental states, mentality, phenomenal states, qualitative states, intentional states, intentionality, subject. Are, are you beginning to get the drift of the fact that all we're doing is sort of um, fooling ourselves? If we keep, especially if we use all of these words as if they were different things, as if sort of one of them explained the other. It's sort of like the Chinese Chinese dictionary. We're not getting anywhere. All the way down to soul, spirit, and mind. That doesn't tell us anything either. So what I want to suggest is that there's one word. One word can do all of this for us. There is there is something underneath there, and that one word is feeling. There are, since we're talking about devices, since we're talking about reverse engineering, devices have internal states, right? The fact that they're internal states doesn't make them problematic. You know, there's stuff that the device does, and then there's the, the gears and stuff that I showed you on the inside that are internal states. So internal still takes us, we're, we're still in ordinary reverse engineering. Mental states, well, when we call them mental, that's one of our synonyms. Uh, I think all we really mean is that they're going on in the mind of a conscious Organism. If it was going on in a toaster or in a computer or in a, uh, um, a, um, com uh, a rocket, we wouldn't talk about mental states. We just talk about internal states. And the reason they're mental is because they're conscious. Either they are the, the state itself is conscious, or the system that is in that state is sometimes in a conscious state. I mean, obviously we sleep sometimes, and we get into deep sleep, or maybe we're not even there. There's still stuff going on in our heads, and if you feel like it, you can call that mental as well. But it's not, it wouldn't be mental if we never had been awake and that we never would be awake. We were simply devices that had gears whirring, in our, whirring around in our heads. What makes them mental, what makes it proper to call them mental states rather than just internal states is the fact that we are, in fact, conscious. And we are conscious systems. And in particular, what makes a system, uh, what makes a state a mental state is that it feels like something to be in that state. Think about it. Not more, not less than that. So feeling, remember, do, Turing is the champion of doing. His test explains all of doing, and that's what's conventionally called the easy problem, explaining our doing capacity. Now, it's a little bit of a play on words to ask, is feeling something we do? Uh, who knows? Uh, even if it is, then it's, it's that one thing that we do that, that you can't account for. But I don't think it's something we do, because I can't see your feelings. I can see your blushing. I can see your, 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 your um, 
facial expression, but I can't see your feelings. The only one who can see their feelings is the first person, the party of the first part. And then we know from Descartes that uh, there's, uh, besides the, the necessary and undoubtable truths of mathematics, there's one other truth, and that's the fact that when we're feeling, we really are feeling. So there's no doubt about the fact that when there's feeling going on, there's feeling going on. The trouble is, we can't account for it. Now, psychokinesis is normally the stuff on the upper left there, you know, to somebody making a, a chair move by the mind over matter, right, uh, without even touching it. But the problem isn't action at a distance. In the middle, you see a, a, a magnetic field, for example, and that's action at a distance. Field, it's not because the person isn't touching the chair that makes it psychokinesis, that it's mind over matter. And in fact, if there's mind over matter at all, it's there in the third case as well, when you're actually lifting uh, or moving, right, voluntarily. Uh, it's still, if there is mind over matter, it's still psychokinesis. It's still doing something because you feel like it. Nothing's pushing you, you're lifting. So the problem is there in ordinary, voluntary, conscious behavior. And the problem is how to explain how and why I feel. It's also called the mind-body problem. The feeling, I prefer to call the mind-body problem the feeling-doing problem because that keeps us, our feet on the ground as to what exactly is the problem. <coughs> How and why do we feel? How is the usual kind of functional question. What are the gears uh, and how do they make us feel? And the other thing is why, and that's kind of an evolutionary question. What, what, what is the, or even a, it could be a, a, a life cycle uh, question, which is what is the, what is it by us? What is the advantage of being a feeling cognitive system rather than a, just a cognitive system that can do, a doing cognitive system? And we're almost done now. Um, the explanatory gap. If, if Turing filled the explanatory space with his notion that, uh, uh, that whatever it takes to pass two, T2 or T3, or if you insist, T4, um, is going to explain everything there is to explain, is true about everything except this last thing I mentioned, which is feeling. And if you want a sort of an exercise, and this is a take-home exercise, in fact, by the way, since this is an online consciousness conference, this is my challenge to people that are, that are going to come in and co comment about how wrong I am. Before you start saying all of that, ex answer the following question. If you have um, a system that you've successfully reverse engineered, and let's say, again, Turing test style, that you've basically accounted for all of its capacities, and its capacities are indistinguishable from ours. I happen to prefer T3, but if you insist on pushing it all, up, all the way up to T4, push it up to T4. You can account for all of that stuff. And now we sit down, and you and you pick uh, which uh, which of the I have no pointer, so I can't do it. But I am now pointing at the clock, or the combustion engine in the middle, or the brain at the bottom. What we can usually do when we're pointing like this is we can point at the clock and say, "Look at that middle gear on the on the right. What's it doing? What difference would it make if I pulled that out?" And it does make a difference. The clock wouldn't work, and the explanation would explain to you causally why. Uh, it wouldn't work without that gear, and what role that gear plays in the whole thing. Same thing for the internal combustion engine, and the same thing is true for every bit of the T4 explanation in the brain. The only trouble is <clears throat> that if you point it a bit, and then somebody says, oh, hang on, but I, I want to add to the fact that we can play chess and, and talk and, and, and recognize objects and all that, all that great stuff. I want to add the fact that we can also feel. How does this stuff explain, how does this uh, a T4 mechanism explain the fact that I feel? Well, the first thing you try to do is say, well, look, there's, there's correlations here. Every time this area of the, of the brain lights up, you're thinking of a pink elephant, right? Um, we've talked about this. Um, you're thinking about a pink elephant. You all, you're the only one who knows for sure that you're thinking about a pink elephant, but I've been doing a lot of neuroimaging on you, and now I know exactly when you're thinking of a pink, pink elephant. I can predict perfectly, and you'll agree with me. It's just like the Church Turing thesis that every time I predict you're thinking of a pink, pink elephant, you are thinking of a pink elephant. So there's your explanation. That's why and how this widget is, uh, explains why you're thinking of a pink And then I just scratch my, my head, and I say, yeah, you know, you're doing a great weather forecasting job, on my mental states, you can predict everything. I'm I'm impressed. But how have you explained something that's so re it's so reasonable to ask, which is why and how 
do I feel something when I'm when you're getting your pink elephant stuff? And maybe, maybe there's some evolutionary reason why it's good sometimes to think of pink elephants, and so and there are consequences, and there'll be something eventually you can pick up as to why it's uh, useful to think of. It. But it's not thinking of pink elephants that we're talking about. It's feeling like you're thinking of pink elephants. In other words, what it feels like to think rather than just do what needs to be done. This is the property of a Turing explanation that always fails systematically when it comes to feeling. And it has to fail because there's no causal room in a, t a Turing explanation. There's no causal room for anything other than the usual forces of nature, which are uh, uh, elect electromagnetism, gravitation, and the strong and weak force, uh, 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 subatomic forces. Maybe all of those forces will one day, in a unified theory, turn out to be all aspects of one single force. But they're enough. They cover all of the um, available territory for causation. There's no room left for a psychic force, according to which you need to feel something, and you need to do it because you feel like doing it, and not just because you're you, the, the, what I sometimes use, it's, it, it, it's, it's uh, neologism, is you do it because you feel like it and not just because you're functing it. <laughs> the idea is that there's a function that you've explained and it's the T4 function, which is when this is active, this is active, and that makes you do this and so on. You have that same explanation, but you'd say it's not enough right? that your gears are driving you to do this. You've got to feel like doing it, otherwise something would, would go wrong. And the typical examples they give, for example, you have to feel the pain, it's not enough to funk the pain, because if you've just funked the pain, and funking the pain means uh, you touch something that's injurious to your tissue, you pull away your, your hand, you learn not to touch that anymore, and all, that, all that adaptive stuff. That's not good enough. You've got to feel the pain, because if you didn't feel it, what? You wouldn't do it? Why wouldn't you do it? What is there in the, in the whole system that implies that, if, that un, uh, uh, unfelt functings don't work just as well as felt functings? In fact, the reason that people even talk about zombies is because a, a T, even a T4, but certainly a T3 robot and, and a T4, it doesn't matter really, a T4 ro robot is always open to the question, look, you built that in a lab, how do I know it really feels? So it could be a zombie that doesn't feel. I'm not introducing a zombie as a, a hypothesis as a real possibility. I, I'm just saying that the flip side of this question that I'm raising and I'm about to finish with is that um, how and why we feel is just the flip side of the question, how and why are we not zombies? Because for all intents and purposes, the T4 explanation is all you need. It's all Darwin needed. It's all the blind watchmaker ever needed. There's no room for more, yet it's there. And of course, I'm not, this is not dualism. I'm not saying there's some other stuff in the universe. I'm just saying, obviously, somehow it happens. But the usual resources of explanation, causal explanation, the kind that works in basic science and also works in reverse engineering, fail when it comes to this explanatory gap. And that's what makes it so hard, and that's why I think it's actually impossible to explain how and why we feel. Okay, the rest of it is up to online consciousness, and all of you are invited to participate, too.